welcome back. We had to take a little bit of a break for us who have been going nonstop since early this morning. Thank you for attending. We're so happy that everybody's here with us virtually. It sure makes the experience wonderful to be able to get this quality of education and uh, advocacy uh, virtually. So we plan on doing this every year as well as attending aviation events in, that are going on in our communities. So uh, while we were on break, I heard that the mailman came and he put something through the slot of my door. I don't know if you can see it. So, you know, I have the pleasure of introducing two aviation legends and they're heroes of mine for sure. They are the only couple that has, holds every category in class of FAA um, rating on their private and on their instrument uh, tickets. And so, you know, I can't even imagine John without Martha or Martha without John. So I think it's fabulous that they're the only couple that has ever received all of those ratings and certificates. Uh, in 2021, they were inducted into the CFI Hall of Fame. There's no, there's no question that they should be there. And then in 2022, Martha was awarded the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. It's interesting because I used King Courses for my instrument and commercial um, tickets, and I am also working on my multi-engine. And I just have to share a quick story about Martha. So I'm up in the Columbia River Gorge and I'm doing my, uh, my commercial check ride. And again, I used the King courses for that. And one, one aspect that I studied was Martha's mock check ride that she did. And uh, so I'm, I have my notebook all prepared and I'm doing the oral. And, and I'm so thorough because I watched what Martha did and I just committed it to memory. And at one point the DPE stopped me as I was showing him the rental car companies that were available at the airport in case I couldn't get these firefighters <laughs> to their destination and uh, whether they had cars or not. And he said, how did you prepare for this? Because this is fantastic. And I said it was the King courses. And so I passed with flying colors and I have uh, John and Martha to thank for that. And their support for California Pilots Association has been unmatched. I will come back later in the afternoon when they're done speaking to uh, let you know about the door prize winners or maybe actually you're gonna announce that yourselves. But uh, so to two legends in aviation, we are so lucky to have them, John and Martha King. Thank you very much, Jolie. Uh, what a, what a wonderful introduction. Yeah, what a wonderful organization um, Cal Pilots is. You know, without Cal Pilots, we wouldn't have aviation in California as we know it today. And if we want to have it this way in the future, we need Cal Pilots. So thank you very much for being there. And you'll save and protect airports for us and protect California flying. So that's wonderful. In case there's any confusion about this, I'm John King. And I'm Martha King. And, and we're really delighted to be talking to you this afternoon. And we are going to, as, uh, going to give you a door prize. And the door prize is what we call a get it all kit. You may not be able to see this. Located a little bit at an angle yeah. and see. Uh, but it's a, a get it all kit. And you choose the get it all kit you want, either private pilot or instrument rating or commercial pilot. For instance, the private pilot uh, door kit or get it all kit consists of um, the private pilot ground school and test prep course that prepares you for your uh, test uh, knowledge test and it also gives you all of your ground school for the private pilot certificate and it also includes the uh, practical test course which is the, that oral that that Jolie talked about it's a it's a video of, uh, of in this case me going through the check ride with an examiner an examiner is asking me all the questions and make me do all the maneuvers and I try to give you a model performance 
And uh, so I'm trying, if, if I don't do a good job, it'd be very embarrassing, but I, I'm, I'm trying to give you a model performance and the examiner is evaluating me and, and we go through it together. And it's, it's a very, very realistic thing because it, it's a real examiner and a real student who's trying very hard. And, and that student is me. And, and so we give you that, uh, that comes with it. And this Get It All kit also includes 15 more videos that, uh, that uh, we call them uh, skills courses. And it's things like uh, takeoffs and landings made easy, um, aviation weather wise and so on. And so, and a whole bunch of things that fill in anything that might not be, um, might, it might not have picked up on when you took the, uh, the uh, check ride course. So, so um, it's all there and uh, it's worth $599. And by the way, I need to tell you that only uh, Cal, Cal Pilot organization members are, are entitled to this, are eligible for this. So uh, put in for it. And if you're not a Cal Pilot member, um, simply join the Cal Pilot organization and you can do it during this talk and you'll be eligible by the time if you get joined by the time we're done, you'll be eligible for it. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's $599 as a gift to you and a, a whole bunch of stuff that will help you in your flying. Martha. Uh, and also, by the way, there should be in the chat window a link that you can click on to join Cal Pilots if you're not currently a member. The second part of our door prize to the same person, <laughs> these need to be at an angle, I guess, but it, it's a King Schools flight bag. Let's see, does that get it better? Uh, well, sorry, we got this background that messes things up, but what the background is, is we were flying a, an R-22 helicopter. I was flying it, Martha had a camera, and we saw these flowers uh, southeast of uh, Paso Robles, uh, and we went down and hovered over the flowers and took this picture. So Martha took this picture out of the window of an R-22 helicopter. And we just can't bear to not have it behind us, because it's, <laughs> it's so, so it's pretty. It's a form of bragging, isn't right, it? Right, right. All right. A couple of other uh, things. Uh, your WINGS credit for this, for the, all the seminars today, will come automatically uh, at the end of the day to the email address that you used when you registered um, today or soon. Yeah, I would say that might be a little, a little soon. It'll come to the email address you used when you registered. At the end of the talk, there will be time for questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A window rather than the regular chat window. And what will happen then is Mike will uh, gather them up and organize them and pass the questions on to us at the end of our talk. So I think that's all the housekeeping I'll, items, I'll, I'll John. I think we should uh, get started on our talk. I think so. Well, you know, folks like you, um, John and I have spent like, uh, our lives in aviation with, with a, and we have a real passion about flying and about pilots. We've always owned and flown probably just a little bit more aircraft than we could quite afford. And um, we learned to fly in a Cherokee 140. We got our private pilot certificates back in Indiana, but we got our instrument rating here in California, in San Diego, actually. And we graduated eventually to a twin Comanche and then to a Cessna 340. And the Cessna 340, which is, a, uh, as you probably know, a cabin class um, uh, twin engine airplane uh, was, was fabulous for us. We used it to fly to our traveling two-day ground schools around the country. And it, it was great for that. It was the first airplane that uh, we had that had pressurization. Yes. And that really, really changed our flying and let us fly in California without having to wear oxygen masks all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a great airplane. We really loved it, but it had one problem. Well, it was, uh, it we got this we sickness, <laughs> right? We we got this real sickness, this very expensive sickness, as, as you can see, because we got the uh, terrible desire to smell jet fuel, and th that is expensive. But no matter what you're flying, pretty soon you want something that goes faster, flies farther, flies higher, and for us. Uh, we got all enamored with the Cessna Citation. And so uh, we lost our heads and we went out and bought one. 
And the transition from the Cessna 340 up to the Citation was really pretty easy because Cessna worked at making it easy, worked at making it a smooth transition with as much commonality in the systems and the switches as was possible between a, a piston aircraft and a, a turbine aircraft. But um, the, the Citation, uh, it, it, ours was, was a very early one. It was before they started numbering the citations as a, a one or a two or so on. We used to call it a citation zero. It was one of the very first business jets ever built. It was also the slowest business jet ever built. It had all kinds of nicknames. It had um, people called it a crustacean. They called it a slotation. Some people called it a mutation. Air traffic controllers called it a frustration because they were constantly having to move us off the airway in order to let a real jet pass well, us. Well, we had that slotation. No, you want to continue, don't you? You've got a couple other things well, to say. Well, uh, some people in here may remember the uh, Beechcraft ads that used to advertise the King Air as flying at um, uh, jet aircraft near, near, near jet. jet speeds. And our citation was the near jet that they were talking about. And it yeah. had a bird strike problem. Well, well, what was the bird strike problem? Bert? Well, it got run down from the rear. So All right. we're, done, we're done with the citation. And we finally did get done with the citation. And, and anybody that flies long enough eventually wants to get something a little faster and carry more and so on. And we decided we wanted to get uh, the old Falcon 10 that we have right now. And it is 150 knots faster than that citation. So we went out and bought that old Falcon 10. As you might guess, it worried the daylights out of our insurance company. So our insurance company says, look, John and Martha, if you're going to fly this airplane, we, we want you to go out and get check get, get uh, uh, type, type rated in it. But not only that, we want to make sure you go out and take the full type rating course where you get in a simulator for, for 21 days. And we did that. It was 21 days taking the type rating course in, that, in our old Falcon 10. And we, we, when we got home, we were just absolutely exhausted. But we figured we must have done okay because the instructor got us aside and he says, look, John, Martha, I've got wonderful news for you. And then Martha wants me to take a drink of water here. I've got wonderful news for you. And I said, well, that's fantastic. What's that? He says, well, you'll never have to worry about a mid-air collision in this airplane. And I said, that's fantastic. Why not? He says, you are so far behind this airplane. You won't even be involved. You're going to come walking up the airplane 15 minutes later and say, what happened here? You know, John likes to think that our relationship exemplifies that old saying that behind every successful man stands a great woman. Well, that's exactly the way I feel about it, Martha. Well, what he doesn't realize is in front of every great woman stands stand some guy without a clue who's blocking her view. <laughs> you know, people often come up to me and say, John, you're lucky that Martha will fly with you. And I say, lucky? What are you talking about lucky? She wants to be captain half the time and, and she uh, it costs twice as much and she's got an opinion about everything. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second while we pull up our uh, PowerPoint. So while Martha's doing it, I want to get one thing straight right now. Yes. Uh, we're not, I'm on, I'm not on the screen anymore. I'll wait till I'm on the screen. I want to make it clear. Martha's only a little bit better pilot than I am. Just a little bit better pilot than I am. Okay. Is that going to keep me out of trouble? Well, probably, probably will. Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do straight talk about aviation safety. And um, one of our concerns is that in aviation safety, uh, people often say things that aren't helpful. And uh, I think we need to be, we, we both think we need to be very careful about how we talk about safety because sometimes I think it gets the wrong result. Now, uh, I assume that about everybody here is a pilot. 
And I want to uh, uh, make a compliment. One of the highest compliments I can pay to someone is to observe they're not normal. And pilots are not normal. The reason I say that is normal people don't do extraordinary things. And to be a pilot, what you have to do is you have to do very difficult things over an extended period of time. And during that time, your right leg shakes, you swell, sweat all the way down to your belt and beyond. Uh, and uh, you're, you're, you're just, it, it wears you out completely. And the reason it wears you out completely is uh, it uses everything you have. Flying is fun because it uses all your aptitudes. It uses your mental aptitudes, it uses your physical aptitudes, it uses your emotional capability, and it requires a lot of motivation and goal orientation. And, you know, goal orientation is a wonderful thing in most of life, but in aviation, it can be a risk factor. And we'll talk more about that later. In general aviation, it's particularly important to us to have very open and honest discussions about safety. And the reason that's particularly important to general aviation is because unlike the airlines, we don't have support systems that are designed to keep us safe. We don't have the dispatchers and we don't have the uh, FAA uh, dictated procedures and uh, operating uh, parameters, and we don't have uh, necessarily that other pilot in the cockpit um, in a two pilot crew to help uh, keep us safe. So in general aviation, risk management is basically up to the pilot. And that's why it's important to have good discussions about safety. Often, the discussions that we do have are not helpful or insightful to our fellow pilots. Um, they can actually sometimes be counterproductive. And here's what I mean by that. Maybe we have a, an accident that's very highly publicized and it gets out the FAA administrator speaking on the, to the media. It gets out the uh, Secretary of Transportation speaking to the media. And you hear them say things like, safety is our number one priority. Or they might say, there can be no compromise with safety. The problem is, this may be very comforting to a non-pilot, but as a practical matter, they are not and cannot be true. They do convey a firm resolve to do better, but they cannot be true. Why can't they be true? Because anytime you go somewhere in an aircraft, you're confirming that moving the aircraft ranks ahead of safety. It would always be safer to stay put. You know, they have a saying about boats. Boats are safest in the harbor, but that's not what boats are built for. And the same thing applies to aircraft. Aircraft are safest in the hangar, but that's not what they're designed for and intended for. Anytime you go somewhere, anytime you start the engine on a motorized vehicle of any sort, an aircraft, a boat, a, a car, there is some risk, a risk that needs to be managed. You know, the thing that's wrong with saying things like safety is our number one priority, or there can be no compromise with safety. The thing that's wrong with that is they're not true. They're intellectual dishonesties. And what they do is they tend to substitute for thoughtfulness. It would be a lot more thoughtful if we talked about the risks that are uh, associated with aviation and how we can take a, take advantage of, how, how we can um, identify those risks and mitigate them. I'll get this right. All right. So safety advice, when one pilot talks to another and they're gonna advise that pilot, very often that advice is preachy, smug and superior, demeaning or offensive and it's criticism. And it, 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 it turns the pilot off. It makes them not wanna to listen to it. But what we really need is helpful guidance. And the helpful guidance we can give is to use risk management. Another term 
that, that people use when they're talking about safety is they talk about aeronautical decision making. And to me, there's a couple of problems with uh, talking about aeronautical decision making. Number one is you say it kind of, kind of implies you get to a fork in the road and make a decision and you don't make the right decision. Um, well, uh, or it says um, you can't make a decision. Well, that's that's nothing but demeaning and, and, it, and it turns you off. You don't want to talk to that person anymore. Another thing he says, you have no judgment. Well, if you tell me I'm lacking judgment, I don't want to talk to you anymore. It's, it's very demeaning. Um, and of course, there's five hazardous attitudes, and the five hazardous attitudes tell you is, is what they're saying is you got a bad attitude. Well, imagine we got a 40 year old student pilot and a 22 year old uh, instructor. It's going to be hard for the, uh, this, the 40 year old student pilot to accept the idea that this that, that this 20 year old instructor is going to help me make decisions or help me with my judgment. So it's it's not a it doesn't make someone want to cooperate with you when you talk that way. So. As I said earlier, uh, aeronautical decision making is offensive, it's demeaning, and the biggest problem with it, it gives no guidance. If someone says to you, you failed at aeronautical decision making, they don't give you any way to go better. How do you get better? And as I said earlier, it's reactive, it implies you come to a decision point and make a decision. What you really want to do is be way ahead of that decision point and use risk management. And risk management is a proactive habit of identifying risks and mitigating them. So you're, you're, you're proactive, you're out ahead of the flight. And before you do the flight, you think about what are the risks? And so uh, I've, I've lost. So, so the clear and honest language that we like would like pilots to use with each other will give positive guidance, whether it's learning pilots or just a friend, a fellow pilot, positive guidance and let you talk about tools, risk management tools. You know, when we talk about safety, what we need to remember is safety is the outcome. It's not what you're doing as you go along. Risk management is how you get safety. So let's expand a little bit, Martha, on risk management. Okay, well, first of all, as a pilot, we think that every pilot needs to conduct risk surveillance, both before and during their flight. And we have three acronyms we like to use, three mnemonics uh, for doing that. They're PAVE, they're CORD, and they're SeaCare. And we're gonna expand on all three of those. So during your flight planning, you can pave your way to a safe flight. And the, the PAVE is a pre-flight tool that you can use not just right before your flight, but preferably uh, quite a bit before as you're planning it. And it's a situational awareness planning tool. And it puts potential risks into four categories. The categories of the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, the environment, and external pressures. And we're gonna expand on these. And by putting risk into these four different categories, they help you organize your thinking about how do I manage the risk, if I found any, in this particular category? How do I mitigate it so that I reduce the risk on a particular flight. So if you want to think about the risks associated with the pilot, here are the kinds of things you want to think about. First of all, um, I say, my, say I'm the pilot. Am I, am I okay today? How am I feeling? The FAA has a checklist for this. It's called the I am safe checklist. Am I ill? Am I taking medication will be a problem? Am I under stress? Am I under the effects of alcohol? Uh, and, uh, and fatigue and food are a factor. For instance, you, a lot of people will fly all day without eating and then go out for a flight that evening uh, and they're tired and they're hungry and they're going flying and they're not in the best mental condition to do that. And finally, emotions. If you're mad at the world, flying an airplane is not the way to work it out. Um, if you're mad at the world, a lot of people tend to want to do something more violent than that and you want, don't want to do that in an airplane. So think about the conditions of the pilot. Well, how are you doing today? Is this the right day for you to fly? And then think about the, the pilot regarding the airplane. Are you current in this airplane? If, is it, if the trip is gonna be an instrument trip, are you uh, uh, instrument rated and equipped? Is it, if it's at nighttime, are you current at nighttime? Can you turn on the lights? Do you know where all the lights are and so on? Uh, so think about the trip. Do you have to fly high altitude? Do you know how to, uh, to uh, operate the airplane in, in high density altitudes? Um, 
just so think about all the, the whole trip and what it's going to require of the pilot. And you ask yourself, am I up to this? Is this the day for me to do these things in this airplane on this trip? And so think about the risks associated with the pilot like that. And another thing you want to think about are the risks associated with the aircraft. Is this the right aircraft for the trip? And, and is it the right trip for this aircraft? Do they match each other? Is it the right trip for this pilot, this aircraft? Uh, and, and all put together, is this the right aircraft to do it with? So think about all of those things and how you're going to manage them. Um, and uh, for instance, one of the things when you think about an aircraft is density altitude. And uh, uh, density altitude is an important point. And if you're going to a high altitude aircraft, is this the right high altitude airport? Is this the right aircraft for it? Another thing to think about the fourth category is the, That's the third category. Third category, <laughs> thank you. Uh, is the environment? What environment are you going to be operating in? Um, are you going to be operating in high density airspace? And if so, are you up to the rapid communications? Are you comfortable with finding your way around or in the airspace and working with air traffic control? Is the environment uh, high mountains? And um, do you have the, the right combination of pilot experience and aircraft capability to handle that? Are you gonna be flying over a large body of water? Maybe the Gulf of Mexico, one, maybe one of the Great Lakes. Flying over a large body of water at night is an IFR operation. You just can't see, there are no lights there and you need to be prepared to do it IFR. And the same thing applies for a lot of the desert area in the Southwest. No lights out there. Uh, it's really an IFR operation if you're operating at night. And the environment includes the weather. What's happening in regard to the weather? Is it relatively benign? Is it gonna be really dicey? Are you trying to beat bad weather into your destination? If so, um, what have you got in, as uh, backup ideas? Think about the whole surrounding environment and how it affects you as a pilot, how it affects your aircraft, and whether there's any mitigations that you need to make in your flight uh, regarding the environment you're going to be operating so, in. So let's take a look. The, the, the pilot, the aircraft, the environment are the three risk categories we've talked about so far. And then many people will identify these risks and come up with a mitigation plan. And when they get in the air, they don't fly it. And why don't they follow their plan when they get in the air? And the answer is the last risk factor is external pressures. And external pressures are the things that are pressing on you to make you to continue the trip or, or internal pressures when, when you shouldn't continue the trip. And why, why do you continue the trip when you shouldn't? A lot of times you set a goal. Uh, we said goal orientation is normally a good thing, but it's not necessarily a good thing in flying. So you're going to meet somebody, you want to be there at a certain time, you set a goal, and that goal orientation tends to make you uh, ignore the risks when you get in the air, particularly if you get a new risk, it makes you do that. So don't let the external and internal pressures make you ignore the risks when you get in the air. And right. so so what, what we really want to do, and Martha and I are trying to do this all the time, develop a plan to mitigate those external, mitigate the pressures before we go. Um, one of the things we do is we take an overnight bag with us uh, in the airplane so that if on every trip. if there gets to be some problem, we say, well, let's just land uh, and have a nice dinner and uh, ch check into a hotel room and we'll deal with this tomorrow. And it takes the pressure away from you. So what, what we do is set it up so that we have some way to get out of the risk so that, of external pressure, get out of that pressure and remove that pressure from us. Okay. The next uh, mnemonic that we use is before takeoff, strike the right chord to manage the risks of the takeoff itself. And this is something that we go through, uh, John and I, every time just before the takeoff, because it's a final risk management assessment of their situation just before we go. So we do this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We do this uh, as we taxiing up to the runway line, we pull off to the run up area. We go through this cord as a, in the cord of the wing, for instance, we go through this cord checklist. 
And we say, and it consists of what are the conditions right now? And we're, and go we're going to elaborate on each of these uh, right. in just a minute. Okay. But CORD stands for the current conditions. What are the hazards? What operational changes do I need to make because of those hazards? Hazards, uh, the runway required and available, the return and the departure. So, talking about the conditions, um, as we said, basically, sorry, what we're talking about are the same four elements that we have in the PAVE checklist the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, and the external and internal pressures. We do a final assessment of those in terms of the pilot. How do I feel? Am I, am I having second thoughts about this flight? Do I not feel particularly good? Um, is, the wet, is the weather worse than I had expected it to be? Is it worse than the, uh, the ATIS at the airport said it was going to be or the forecast said it was going to be? It's a last minute update on all of the things you were gonna do in the PAVE checklist. You're at the runway uh, hold short line or in, in the runup area, and you're thinking about it, oh, how about this? Is this, what's the wind? What's the ceiling? What's the visibility? And you're, it's your last assessment of things before you get airborne. So you do that, and then the next item is the H, the hazards associated, associated with those things that you just looked at. Right, so you look at those and you, you think, okay, as I go through these PAVE items, these four categories, what hazards do I need to mitigate and you're particularly thinking about hazards that might be new. Maybe, maybe there's unusually heavy air traffic at the airport right now and you didn't realize there would be, or the winds are different than you thought they were gonna be, and maybe you need to do something about it. So that leads you to the O, which is operational changes. In terms of operational changes, we're thinking things like, uh, do you need to, change the flat position that you were gonna use for takeoff? Do you need to do a stationary takeoff instead of a rolling takeoff? Do you need more crosswind correction? Do you need to semi bail and ask the, uh, if it's at a controlled airport, ask the tower for a runway that's more lined up into the wind or choose one for yourself if you're at an airport without a tower? What operational changes if any, do you need to make because of the change in conditions and the hazards? Now, uh, another the R stands for, there's two R's here. The runway required and available is the first R. And you get the runway required from the, uh, the checklist and the and it, and performance charts for the aircraft. And runway available, of course, comes from the uh, airport diagram. And so you match those up. Do, they, do I have enough runway? Uh, uh, runway capability uh, for, with this airplane, uh, considering what's, re what's available to me. And you remind yourself, if you will, okay, do I have double the runway I need? Do I have 5% more runway available than I actually need? And it's kind of a reminder of sometimes you need to make sure that you've got your A game on as soon as you put that power forward. And then and the, and the second R stands for return. And the return is, if I had to go back to the airport right away, let's assume I had a sick engine, where would I, what would I do? And, and, and let's assume it's a single engine airplane, uh, if you have a sick engine, you need to know where you can go. And everybody talks about the impossible turn. And there are conditions where the turn is, is possible, where you turn back to the airport or back to the runway you're on. But the problem with that is you need to have be ahead of it. You need to know uh, what altitude can I make it? How, how high do, uh, do I have to be before I can do that return um, in an, on an engine failure? And, uh, and where am I going to go? And what route do I take to get back? So you need to figure that out and, and actually practice it in advance. And when you're thinking of the altitude, you want to know the altitude that what it's, what it's going to be on your altimeter. You need to have it figured out for your altimeter, uh, not just a, a, the, uh, a, an AGL altitude. So you have to set an altimeter uh, uh, in your mind, a, a return altitude that you have to be at before you return. So if you're going to do a return, you're going to make the impossible turn, try and get back to the airport. You need to know 
what altitude you have to be at. You need to know the conditions. And if you don't have those conditions, then you do a, a return without the 180 degree turn. And you, you figure out where I'm gonna go and you're, you're returning to the ground. You're not necessarily returning to the airport, but, but you need to have figured out in advance, is there an open area here? And you can do this with a satellite map before you go. Where can I go? Where there is there, is there a big field? A lot of times, People ignore a great big field available to them. And another concern is another op opportunity is can you go to a freeway? You can get the lane that's going your direction and, and maybe it'll work out fine because there can be a lot of space there. So you need to have thought that through before you go and you need to be able to articulate that before you take off. And we do it, and when we, we fly two pilots all the time. As I said, Martha's only a little bit better pilot than I am. And, and so we have a conversation back and forth on each of these items. And so uh, it, it helps to have studied the, and, and we have with us right in the airplane on an iPad, we have a satellite map. And we look at the satellite map, so okay, here's what we're gonna go. Here's where we're gonna go, here's what we're gonna do. And then finally, the last D is uh, the departure. Let's assume you're gonna uh, depart without any problems at all. I think we went backwards there for a minute. We did, sorry. Um, okay, and so on the departure, it's, it's if you're, if you're IFR, it's your clearance, where you're gonna go. If you're VFR, once again, you've been looking at the satellite map and, and uh, where am I gonna go to, to avoid airspace and to avoid terrain? And, and what procedure am I gonna use to depart VFR? So you, what the idea is you get all of this figured out before you go and you're not doing it on the fly, so to speak. And this gives you an opportunity to do that. And that's what the cord checklist is all about. It's about planning. So that's the cord checklist. And then we've got when you're airborne, you can take care with a double C to manage the risk while you're airborne. And what that involves, the, the uh, care with a double C, and we're going to- uh, We call it C care. C care. We're going to elaborate on this. The first C is changes. The second C is consequences. The A is for alternatives. The R stands for reality, and the E again is for external and internal pressures. So what you're basically doing here, the, the first C, the changes says, once you're airborne, everything in PAVE, the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, and the external internal pressures start changing. And there are consequences to those changes. So what you need to do is maintain what I call a risk management attention scan, where you're, you've got control of the aircraft, but your mind is spoken out on a regular basis to what are the consequences of changes over time? What alternatives does that leave me with? What is the reality of my situation? And are external pressures starting to operate on me in a bad kind of way? So as the changes happen, the first thing you want to think about is the consequences. Now, when you think about the consequences, you want to think about the consequences through several lever, lever, levels. I can do this through several, several levels. Uh, it's unfair to put those R's and L's together in two words. Um, and for instance, let's assume you get airborne and you look at your GPS, you look at your ground speed and son of a gun, you're 20 knots slower than you thought you were gonna be. All right, um, well, let's think through, the, think through the consequences. What are the consequences? Well, you're gonna be late getting to your destination. You're gonna be lower on fuel getting to your destination. You're going to be fatigued, more fatigued because you're taking longer. Um, and you're also going to have more pressure on you because uh, you're, you're late and you probably might have someone waiting for you. There's a reason you're making this trip on the other end and so on. So you, you think about all of those things and, and, uh, you're, and you're going to land with lower fuel. So all of those things are consequences, and that's the first level of consequences. Now, if you want to think through the several levels, uh, you can think of the next level. Now, if your ground speed is different than you thought it would be, what's likely the cause of that? Well, the wind. The wind is likely to be different than you thought it would be. Well, the wind controls pressure patterns in fronts or as a result of the pressure patterns in fronts. So the pressure patterns in fronts are not what you thought they would be and you'll have different weather than you thought you were gonna be. So now you know you've got all of those first consequences uh, that you're gonna be late, and lower on fuel, under pressure, uh, and, and, and now you're gonna be landing in weather that's different than you thought it was gonna be, likely to be worse than you thought it was gonna be. So when you think down through the several layers of the consequences, 
consequences, things get more complicated. And that's gonna have a difference on your alternatives. Now, uh, the, the most important consideration in all of flying is always have alternatives. It's the most important consideration in flying. Now, when you take off, you have a circle of alternatives and that circle, let me get on screen, that circle of alternatives is equal to your fuel, uh, plus your reserves in all directions. So in all directions all around you, you have that big circle of alternatives. And as you continue to fly, that circle of alternatives gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so when you uh, get to the airport, your circle of alternatives is only equal to your reserve fuel in all directions. Now, as you're flying along and things get complicated, it becomes a no brainer for you to pick out somewhere en route and land and expand that circle of alternatives now back to your whole uh, fuel possibilities um, plus the reserves. So now you have a huge circle of alternatives and everything gets easier. So always think in terms of your alternatives and always having alternatives and having easy alternatives will make it easier for you. So, uh, so you You've looked at the consequences of the changes. And one of the things that we as pilots have a very difficult time dealing with is reality when it intrudes on what we want to do, when it threatens to keep us from completing our flight, from completing the goal that we set out to do. And so as pilots, we always need to remember reality. We need to remember to deal with things as they really are, not the way we plan them to be. Well, Martha, if pilots don't deal with things as they really are, you might say that they're in denial. Is that correct? They are in denial okay. well, because it. you really want to get this flight done because not necessarily because it there's a specific event or something, but just because you planned it and you want to go there and you're not as a personality as a pilot, you're not used to having your plans and goals frustrated. And as a pilot, one of the things you're used to being in life is completing things as you just, as you set out to do, completing things you set out to do. Correct. And you're not used to giving up on, on your plans and you're used to making things happen. That's how you became a pilot. Right. Now, one of the examples of the problem of that of denial is the biggest cause of cross-country fatalities. The biggest cause of cross-country fatalities is continued VFR flight into worsening weather conditions. Now, think about this for a minute. Do you think that pilots really take off in weather that they know is going to kill them? Of course not. The problem is that they get a forecast that maybe it's marginal, but it seems okay. And they take off VFR and the weather either gets worse or is worse from the get-go than they thought it was going to be. And what do they do? They keep right on going as if the weather was the same as they planned for. So the, 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 the bottom line is when things change, you have to change your plan. You have to do things differently if things are different when you get there. The weather is never to be depended on exactly what it reports or exactly what it forecasts at the airport. The real weather is what you're seeing out your windshield right then, and that's the reality that you have to deal with. The same thing for any mechanical issues or, or anything else that's going on, your own physical condition. When things change, when they're different from what you planned, you have to change your plan. The problem, the reason we have trouble changing that plan, as John said earlier, is those external and internal pressures on us, our own goal orientation that says we don't want to give up on this plan. That's how we became pilots. We were persistent. We stuck to it. We worked our way through things. We became pilots. And it's a fabulous characteristic for most of life. But as you can see, 
Goal, orienta goal orientation is a risk factor. It's the thing that makes you ignore all the other risks of flight. It's a real problem if we don't understand that goal orientation can be a major risk factor for us as pilots. When good risk management may tell us that it's time to do something different. Well, goal, goal orientation tends to make us keep on going when good risk mitigation says we should change our plan. And, 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 and we have to come to terms with that tension. It's very complicated. So we don't wanna be as rigid as the airlines. The airlines uh, don't have much flexibility in all their plans. And general aviation, one of the reasons you fly in general aviation is, is you have flexibility and can do things different. And so uh, we, should, we should be willing to come to terms with that tension of, of not being able to complete our plans. Uh, right. so, so what we're saying is don't let the internal and external pressures make you ignore the risks of flight. Uh, and, Sorry, I've been the wrong way. Okay, all right. Uh, so we recommend that you use FAVE, CORD, and C-CARE. We hope to, to manage your in-flight risks. And at this point, we would like to make a special wish for you. Folks, keep the pointy end forward, the dirty side down, and by all means, please. Me out of the trees. Thanks a lot, folks. I hope you're having fun. And now, uh, Mike, can you check and see if you've got some uh, uh, questions for us? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, not a lot. One kind of funny, I think maybe tongue in cheek question was if you forget what a letter of an acronym is, does that mean we're going to crash now? It does. It does. <laughs> you are screwed. That's... <laughs> and it's particularly bad if you're making a talk and you can't remember what. Right. I, my The tongue in cheek answer I was almost going to type was just land. And then <laughs> use some tools. You can't remember and, land. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's land somewhere and then find some tools and use them to figure out what that letter was and then go take <laughs> off again and then crash. Get on the internet and find out what that letter was. Right. <laughs> um, I did come up with a, a couple of thoughts of my own, if, if you'll uh, permit me. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, excellent talk. I've, I've heard you and seen you to do this presentation before. And it's always excellent. It's always good to have a, a kind of a reminder of some of these kinds of things that we should be thinking about on a regular basis. So thank you very much for that. Um, one of the sayings I've always used, you talk about this in the context of a departure from an airport and trying to think about your return. What's your return plan going to be? And my mantra has been figure out what the, what the possibilities are that could go wrong and consider what your options are ahead of time nobody likes surprises in an airplane surprises are meant for birthday parties not airplane flights one of the things that uh, we do when we're um, departing and you know it's different in a single versus a twin but we uh, we look at the weather at the airport and we say okay if we have a problem presumably not a double engine failure but um, uh, some kind of issue do we come back to this runway or do we go to a completely different airport? Do we come back IFR or VFR? And if we come back, do we come back to the same runway or do we go to a different one? And sometimes uh, uh, we will be going through that and, and we'll suggest, you know, it's great VFR weather, we could come back to this runway. And one or the other of us would say, Yes, but there's no real maintenance at this airport. Maybe instead we should go to this other powered airport that's 20 miles away and we'd have more alternatives. Assuming, of course, that we're, uh, we're not you know, losing major parts where we can't, don't, don't have the ability to do that. I'm and sorry. Another Gary. thing to take into consideration, if you're in a light twin, uh, you need to take into consideration it's reduced rate of climb on one engine and think about, can you uh, uh, clear the terrain in this area? Which, which, which direction what could, should I go considering this reduced rate of climb that I have? So that, that's a big consideration in twins. Like Very true. And um, I'm an airline pilot. I know we have several airline pilots on the, the uh, webinar as well. And, and I can say that one of the things we consider is a takeoff alternate. 
airport. And so this is all pre-planned out ahead of time. If I have this kind of a problem, I'm going to go to that airport over there. If I can't get into this one, if I do come back to this one, what happened during that takeoff? Do I have some parts laying on this runway that maybe I can't land on this one? Maybe I need to use a different runway. And, you know, these are all considerations that need to play in there. And do, on every takeoff, do you have a do you have a designated takeoff alternate? Not every takeoff, uh, not a designated alternate. We we do in the case of weather. Essentially, if the weather is low enough that we can't complete an approach to return, mm -hmm. and, and it's only for the consideration of weather. On a tactical individual basis, for every takeoff that I brief with my crew, I tell them, okay, if, if for, we need to come back for some reason, here's what we're going to do. And that's that's on the captain, on the, the crew at that moment. And it's the same sort of thing I do in the general aviation world as well. You know, what are my options? Yeah. Well, that's what court is all about for us. So if, so if we have a problem, where are we going to go? And oh. we designate that then. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the, the last little portion of your talk, you, you talked about assessing these things that come up during the flight and continuing assessing uh, what are your options at that moment. And it's really easy to want to continue the plan. We call this plan continuation bias. Right. It's right. so easy to keep doing that, but you really have to have a, always consider it. Um, my friend Brian Schiff on the call here with us, his favorite saying that I've adopted myself is, my biggest safety thing in my airplane is my suitcase doesn't care where it spends the night. I can go anywhere. And in the airline world, that's another part of it that the crew, the pilots don't care where they spend the night. We don't have a vested interest in getting to that destination. We have a vested interest in getting to somewhere. And I think that plays into that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. But many times we're our own worst enemy and and continuing on and or even taking off sometimes. We, we've lost some good friends who've taken off and, and lost control of the aircraft and, and trying to fly actually virtually VFR and IMC. And it just doesn't work. And, uh, and to have lost such good friends over it, it makes me angry. Yeah, we've got a, a question here from Diane who, who says uh, she agrees completely. Your acronyms and definitions are absolutely correct. Uh, she had a friend who ignored risks, tried to fly over a huge storm to get somewhere in a hurry, could not get high enough, and killed himself, his wife, and three kids when a wing broke off his plane. Wow. That's the consequence of that kind of, of I got to get there. I got to continue this plan. That is a bummer. Yeah. That's true. So, uh, you know, people, every now and again, I hear people talking about, well, you know, Mike must be an excellent pilot. I don't think I'm a great pilot. I don't think I'm any better than anybody else. Based on my years of experience and thousands of hours in the air, though, I think I've uh, developed an ability to see a problem from a little farther away where the adjustment that's necessary to to deal with it is much smaller. So you make I, a I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Well, uh, I'd like to see if we can do something. We often in this talk give a, a yes or no question. And if the question is yes, we'd ask them to hold up their hand. Can we ask them to hold up their hand here and find out how many people held up their hand electronically? I think we can do that. If you're watching there, you might have a you might have a raise hand button down at the bottom. Yeah, I see a lot of hands go up. So yeah, okay, yes, it looks right, like yeah, we can do that. Can. Okay. All right. Here's the question. And I, if the uh, question is yes for you, I would like to leave your hand up and uh, put it up and leave it up, and then we'll we'll talk about how many people do that. And the question is, in this group, how many people know someone personally who has been killed in an aviation accident? That's a great question. Let's throw hands up here. And there we've got uh, almost 100 attendees on. And I'm seeing about 30 hands right now. So about a third of the group. Yeah, that, see, that's a, that's a real, real bummer. And, and if you pose this question, <clears throat> Uh, to a room full of flight instructors, uh, you'll get about 90% of them. Yeah. Yeah, That's it's true. true. And, and then everyone who's a flight instructor in the room sits around and wonders, what did I miss? What could I have said? What yes. could I have taught at some moment Correct. that would right. have helped? I, I'm surprised. It's only, do you have a way of counting it? Uh, you say it's about 30. Is that, 
Is that I, normally it's around 50 percent when we ask that question? Maybe I didn't ask. It. There's probably a few who couldn't find their hands to raise. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't look at the end of their arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little tougher on Zoom. I don't I don't see where you were. Uh, maybe if we went to the more. Yeah, it, it, if you can pull up the participants list, you'll see the, the yeah, numbers. It's like an item on the more for us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you say we there. pull up the participants list. Okay, I don't see it, but, but anyway, um, and it's a thing that made us feel that- um, You can see the hands here. We might be able to make a difference, and if we can, we have an obligation to do that. And that's, that's why we've developed these talks. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, uh, Melissa, oh, hi, Melissa. It's good to see you here. Uh, she says, I, I took off in a tail dragger from a single runway airport with a significant 90 degree crosswind. Decided if I had to come back immediately, I'd land on a perpendicular road and taxiway that was directly into the wind. So, <laughs> considering sometimes a taxiway might not be the best option. It's not. It's not a bad idea. Um, and we have an airport in Imperial County over in the desert, about eighty miles east of San Diego, and sometimes they get a very stiff. The, the runway is basically northwest southeast. But sometimes they get a very strong wind out of either the east or west. And the agricultural operators there will very frequently in those kind of conditions, they, they want to keep flying. They use the taxiway for takeoff and landing. They used to have a flight service station on the field. And the flight right. service station would recommend a taxiway. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, I was flying a, a Cessna 207 once from Louisiana to uh, Tucson and uh, flying across West Texas there and Southern New Mexico. The winds were well above forecast everywhere. Finally, we, yeah. we had to land landed in Lordsburg, New Mexico, and it was a hellacious wind, about a 30 knot crosswind component. And the, the, the POH for the airplanes said it had a 25 knot demonstrated max crosswind component. So. I emailed Cessna right after and said, hey, I just demonstrated 30 knots. So, but <laughs> after we refueled, I, I told the guy I was flying with, I said, you know, I'm seriously considering taking off on the ramp here. At least it's straight into the wind and we'll be off. But, you know, we could use the length, the width of the runway as the length. Right. <laughs> well, we thought about it for just a couple of moments. And, <laughs> but you didn't do it, huh? Then decided, you know, maybe we better use a runway. Yeah. 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 It's not, it's not clear in my mind which is a safer operation. Agreed. Yeah, Agreed. if there was a tower there, they'd probably say something like, leave at your discretion or clear for takeoff <laughs> <or> your, your, <laughs> at your own risk. <laughs> uh, let's see, I don't see any other questions coming in. Okay, so well, I have a comment then. Uh, Julie, has, uh, Julie has shared with us the name of our door prize winner for today. Oh, who won? What And what did they win? Uh, they won the uh, get it all kit of their choice, which is the uh, private pilot or instrument rating or commercial pilot or flight instructor or the return to flying mm -hmm. VFR and IFR get it all kits, which have the ground school and the practical uh, test course and about 15 skills courses along with it and they also includes the king schools flight bag and the winner today is drum roll uh, oh, wow wow uh, philip vardara easy for you to say vardara you are the winner and uh jolie has send us your email address and your phone number. And early next week, our um, marketing guy, John Dowd, will be in touch with you to arrange for the delivery of your door prize. So congratulations, Philip. It must, it must be your lucky day. You just won uh, something worth 600 bucks. So it must be your lucky day. <laughs> A little more than 600 because yeah. of flight bags. Right, closer to closer. 700. Right. <laughs> and he says in the chat, woohoo, I never win anything. And I use the Kings <laughs> well, for my that. private pilot license. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's great. So that that's all from us. And thank you all very much for your questions and participation. And thank you very much, Mike, for your 
comments there at the end. They were very helpful and enlightening. They were insightful. You know, You're welcome. You know, Mark, we do have a couple more comments that came in oh, if you want right. to hang oh, yeah. tight for just a second. Go ahead. Uh, Michael says uh, he just recently took off from a faraway airport. And on climb out, the tachometer gauge fluctuated excessively. He says he almost diverted, but continued the flight. When he landed, he found the mag was out. What should he have ah. done? Was the engine running smoothly? Yeah, he didn't say. It must. Yeah, and it kind of depends. He says, yes, it was running smoothly. Um, you know, it was probably firing on the other mag, uh, especially. Oh, yeah. yeah. Worth. It's an interesting issue, though. Um, we, one of the thing, some of the things that you would think about uh, is: is this an airplane that you regularly fly? Is it your own airplane or a rental? And do you know uh, what it normally sounds like and feels like, and how it performs? Um, I I doubt that there's anyone on here that would uh, realistically say that general aviation. Uh, flight gauges are absolutely reliable and accurate. Um, yeah, my question is, is there a place where you could have gotten it down safely without adding to the risk? And if you could have get, gotten it down without adding to the risk, I'd, I'd get it on the ground. It, it would be worth going back and checking it out unless there was some reason why he couldn't go back, such as... Um, uh, the weather, he took off in weather such that he could leave, but uh, the approach was probably not doable. It depends on the risks involved. It, it depends on the risks of going versus staying. The, the, you know, one of the things when you go back and have a mechanic look at it, very often you learn more things and there are more implications to the problem than you, than you realize. So it may not, it could have been, as we saw in this case, more than just a tachometer problem, it could have been a mag problem. And you find that out. And, and so it's, it, the engine's talking to you. It's not, it's, I'm not working right. And so the moral of the story is, if you can get it down without adding to the risk, it's the thing to do. Because when, if the, when the engine talks to you or the airplane talks to you and you ignore it, it's not uncommon for it to start shouting at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Yeah, these sorts of problems don't normally get better in flight. They right. almost always get worse. And they, they don't uh, deal with themselves, right? Yeah, uh, and it could also be uh, some of the more modern tachometers work off a, a, an electrical signal out of the mag as opposed to a mechanical uh, uh, drive off of the engines. So right. Right. You, know, it, you could have a, a bad plug wire or bad plug instead of the whole bad mag it could be the whole mag you need to know how your system works and how is that gauge getting its information and what right. could the problems be well the place the troubleshooters is under yeah let's see uh dual says he landed in gulfport mississippi in a 40 knot crosswind uh when he had 42 hours of flight time he said never did it again good well, idea yeah maybe he added to the risk <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little bit um yeah. Let's see. Uh, somebody else say, saw a tail no, tail dragger depends. take off on the ramp when the, with big winds. There are um, times when you can get caught and you don't have alternatives. But the name of the game is to be looking as far ahead as you can. And these days, uh, with things like foreflight in the cockpit and the ability to um, receive ADSB information in. Um, even if you don't have something like Sirius XM in a glass panel, you can still get information all around the, the country. And looking out as far ahead of your aircraft as you can to see, you know, ForeFlight will tell you if you're flying into VFR, marginal VFR, or IFR conditions, you can look and see what the winds are. Um, there's a huge amount of information available if we just set ourselves up with the right equipment to make use of it. You know, we said uh, hey, always having an alternative is the most important consideration in all of flying. Um, an alternative isn't an alternative if you aren't, if you aren't willing to land. Um, so so you, you, you got to be able to figure out how you can land without adding to the risk. Yeah, you've got all this additional information. Are you really willing to act on that? And, and if, uh, if not, then why do you? 
why do you have it? Why do you need it? And, and I would say that the, the addition of the in-flight information that's available to us today is probably the single biggest enhancement in safety I've seen in, in the 40 some years I've been flying. That, sure. um, I, I did a talk recently on flying to Oshkosh and back this summer and on the onboard weather information I had available that allowed us to make in-flight decisions like I've, we've never been able to before. I think it's amen, yes. amazing. Yes. So let's see. Uh, yeah, Robert says in, in response to this discussion on the, uh, the mag failure, uh, check each mag first. That's part of the process when you have a rough running engine is check each mag. Uh, it could be a cable or attack generator failure. That's true. Uh, and what I would add is if you turn one mag off and the engine runs better, don't turn it back on again. <laughs> <laughs> Run on the one that the engine, the airplane runs smoothly. Yeah. Uh, let's see. But and, at that uh, point, you know, you're down to one mag and maybe you'd be better off. You know, if you're close to your, if this happened very recently after the takeoff maybe you're better off putting it back where you took off from yep yeah very possibly yeah and uh, the other thing i do in my 182 is i just declare an emergency right after takeoff because i'm down to one engine <laughs> <laughs> well i'll bet they love you mike <laughs> uh, let me see. An emergency is it results in a lot of conversation and a lot of times it, well, if you really do have an emergency you, you got a lot of things to think about. Fuel and say you lost an engine, fuel imbalance, hydraulic considerations. Um, but on the other hand, you can always declare an emergency, and when they start firing questions at you, just say, "Be quiet." Unable, right? Right. Stand by. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And but on the other hand, I think it's really important to go through that process of declaring an emergency and getting that on the the record, um, if for no other reason that it's a it's kind of a validation of your position. It's a personal acknowledgement that you're in a situation that you might need some help. And, and I think it gets the pilot around to acceptance of the situation a little bit better and acknowledging that. Uh, and it, it allows you to move on to the, the process of dealing with it much easier, I think. But when we, when we see a situation where we are operating, say, on one engine and, and they start delaying us for traffic, that gives us a big incentive to say, hey, we have an emergency and we need to go straight to the airport. Yep. Yep. I agree completely. Uh, well, let's see. We're just about out of questions in here. So you guys are giving away all the prizes you're giving away? <laughs> yes. Yes. So sorry. And, you know, you know, I've got it all. Martha, you and I have been kicked out of some real nice places. So we <laughs> kicked it out. Well, you've what never been kicked out of a, as nice a place as this. Right. <laughs> Well, thank you for having us on. We, we enjoyed it and uh, uh, hope everybody uh, got some insights.